Well, let me just let me jump right in. And uh, again, as the Holy Spirit leads you, you say whatever you want to say. We're going to trust God in this. But um, Pastor Ricky, what advice do you have for a predominantly white church in a predominantly white part of the state of Arkansas about race? You know, the the easy answer for a church like New Heights could be keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I, I can honestly say I've, I've dealt with many churches across the United States of America and uh, New Heights is a phenomenon to me. My first encounter with New Heights uh, was when I went to your Facebook page and the first picture that I saw was an African-American male, I think in Atlanta who had been murdered and you all were praying for the family. When I, when I tell you right then, uh, before I met you, before I met Jim, before I met Josh Foliot, before I met any of your staff, it was an automatic bond with me with New Heights because I saw then a church that was willing to do something <laughs> that uh, many black churches were not willing to do. Uh, and, and the city of Memphis, which is 65% African-American, uh, no white churches did. And so the easy short answer would be to keep doing what you're doing. But I'm well aware that there are more churches than New Heights and the Pursuit of God churches that are going to have access to uh, this opportunity that we're sharing today. So I want to give some, some, some things that I want to that I believe, and I want to, by the way, say I'm no Martin Luther King. <laughs> I'm no expert on race relations, but I have made a commitment for that to be a main priority uh, in my life for the rest of my life. And if I could, I want, I'd like to share this scripture uh, with you right now, in Malachi 3 and 16. And when we had Jim in uh, to be a part of our seven panel racial, racial reconciliation, there's a guy named Pastor Dan that that read this scripture that has stuck with me. It says, and then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. They spoke often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. Uh, and a book of remembrance was written, therefore, before him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, and in the day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his son and that serveth him. And this is really important. He, he says, then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked and between them that serve God and him that serveth him not. And so again, I want to I want to thank God because one of the things that we didn't just meet one time, we have had dialogue, we've we've pulled on up to each other, we've understood each other. And, and so with that being said, you know, some of the things that I'm going to share with you, remember my thoughts, my perspective may be a little different than yours, New Heights, uh, and those who are listening, and they're supposed to be. And, and your thoughts are different than mine. What we've got to do is we've got to respect the voice, the vision, the victories, and the victimizations of others that we've communicated with if we really want to see the vision and the victories of God's be fulfilled. And so as I talk to you today, some of mine, you're going to have the opportunity to be enlightened. You're going to have the opportunity to be transformed. You're going to have the opportunity to be a transformation agents for nations and generations, but you're also going to have the opportunity to be offended. And I want to I want to challenge you to rebuke that opportunity to be be offended. Uh, again, my past friend, Pastor Dan, he made a statement to me. He said the significant problems that we face today cannot be solved at the same levels of thinking that we were at when we created these problems. And I think for many of us, we won't don't want to acknowledge that we when I say we. I mean all sides, the black side, the white side, the Hispanic side, the rich side, the poor side, the educated side, the uneducated side. I think we all have to get to a point that we acknowledge that we've played a role at where we are in, that, of where we are in as a society today. 
and so some of us got tricked into the role. Some of us got pulled into the role. Some of us didn't realize we were playing the role, but we all are playing in the role and where we're here today. So I'm gonna get to the point that you asked me and I'm gonna run through them real quick. And these are 14 things that I think that a church who is committed like New Heights or who wants to be committed and display the example that New Heights is doing that they can, should uh, do in order for us to create a, uh, uh, an atmosphere on the earth that pleases God. Number one is love like the Father. Love like the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So as a church as a whole, we've got to begin to love like the Father. Number two, we got to live like Jesus. We got to live like Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father lest they come toward me. We should, not, we should be ashamed to go to the Father if we're not living like Jesus. And so number three is we got to have the long suffering of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is long suffering. I know we want to we want to do one event and we want people to receive Jesus as Lord and say you can be totally transformed and transform and step into the marvelous light. But one of the gifts of the spirit is we have to be long suffering. And so if we're going to see transformation, it's not going to happen overnight. We're not going to do one event. We're not going to sit down and have one racial reconciliation meeting and all of a sudden all of the community is going to come together. We're going to have to put up with each other and bear each other's burden for a long time because some people don't get it as quick as other people get it. And so we've got to be patient in the getting it process for somebody else. Number four, we've got to create an environment you know, with the social media right now, with the news stations, you know, I said sometimes CNN will make you SIN if you listen to too much news. <laughs> it, 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 and we don't realize it's programming us. And when I say it's programming us, the question becomes who's programming us? And then we've got to remember as believers that Satan is the prince of the air, of the airways. And a lot of times this stuff is, is coming upon and hitting our algorithms on social media. And many times it's confirming our fears and our insanities and our insecurities and our anxieties. So we've got to create an atmosphere like the angels did in heaven where they were surrounding the throne saying, holy, 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 Holy. Sometimes we've got to call conversations back in from our family members, from our friends, from our church members. When we see them tilting off a little way to the spirit of offense, the spirit of anger, the spirit of uh, self-serving, and we've got to be the voice of the angels. The word angel means messengers. We've got to be the messenger members of time in our environments that's saying holy, holy, holy. Number five, we got to listen like Luke. We got to listen to people like Luke. What was Luke? Luke was a physician. That word physician means a healer. So we've got to listen to people, know they're sick, be around their sickness, and try to discern how we're going to heal their sickness. And many times we assume certain sicknesses and we start trying to fix people before we hear what their sickness is. And so you got to be a healer and a listener like Luke. Never under, number six, never underestimate the spirit of laughter. Never, you know, if I mention Lee's name, Pastor Lee's name and Pastor Jim's name, my wife is going to automatically smile. She's going to automatically smile. Why? Because We've healed each other through the, through the ministry of laughter. And some of that laughter came through laughing at ourselves from some of the stupid things that we've done in the past. But one way that that will never happen. One of, one of the reasons that that happened is that we could laugh at some of the stuff that probably would have been angry about or offended about uh, years ago, because when there's a bridge called trust, which is created, built on a foundation of transparency. You can laugh at some of the things that probably would have brought you to war at years ago. Learn from each other. 
learn. I think sometimes uh, what we see as uh, uh, inner city pastors, we will see <laughs> laymen that will come into our environment and want to talk to the senior leader in the inner city or the African-American church like he's just flat foot ignorant. Come in, yes, there's some things that you can teach, but come also in with a spirit of learn. What do, what do I need to learn? What, what are some of the areas that I missed it in? What are some of the areas I can grow? What are some of the areas that you are doing great in that we're not doing so great? And so when you're learning from people, they feel that you, res you respect them. Uh, uh, number eight is lead like the Lord. The Lord was a sacrificial leader, and we'll talk about that later. And, and this is really important. <clears throat> and again, I say so many of these things New Heights is doing, like me. Don't just love me. Love is a requirement from God, but like is an option. Like me and make you feel, oh, I love you. I love you. You know, no, no. Love me and like me. Make me feel like uh, you're, I'm important to your presence, that I add some value to your life. So begin to like people. Number 10, <laughs> lean and find an area where I can help you and allow me to be how shall I say this? Uh, don't, don't, don't just allow me to be a welfare case to you, but allow me to be a warfare with you, beside you, and even uh, an entrepreneur. Allow me to be a businessman with you, a businessman to you. And so we have to be careful that sometimes, and I know it's out of pure passion, good intent. Sometimes we go, and I think they call it the turkey the turkey theory. You want to come in during holidays and, and, and bring a turkey. And I call that feel-good ministry. Can I see you? And again, I'm not talking directly to, because I can attest for that you all are doing this, but I'm saying to some other people who may be tuning into our conversation, uh, uh, can I see you beyond Thanksgiving and Christmas? Can I, can I see you other than the back to school backpack drive. Can I see you in my neighborhood, in my, uh, can you invite me other times than the Halloween or the hallelujah party that, that you're having? And so I'm almost done here. Uh, leverage relationships, leverage relationships. What Josh did, Memphis Josh, see we got a, we got a Fayetteville Josh and a Memphis Josh. What Memphis Josh did, Josh knew my heart. Josh knew your heart, Lee. And what he did was he leveraged a relationship. I didn't know you. You didn't know me. And he could have been stingy with the relationships. He could have got all of the wealth, influence, resources, wisdom from you that he could have got. He could have got all the wealth resources, influence, wisdom, and connection from me that he got. But he used himself to be a bridge to connect a 90% white congregation to a 90% black congregation so we can be a 100% Christ uh, relationship together. And so I wanna challenge people to leverage relationships and uh, uh, I'm gonna save this one to last because this one the one that's probably gonna give some people opportunity to be offended. So I'll push that one to the end. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us to obey the laws of the land. And I'm certainly a law abiding citizen. And I agree that we should obey the law of the land. There's no but, but there's an and with that. And sometimes we gotta recognize that there are some laws that need to be changed. And so there are people like, like uh, New Heights or congregations who have substance, who have wealth, who have influence. There are some laws that are on the books that you recognize that are probably 
outdated or may have been written in racial content at the particular time that we know that are not healthy for expanding the kingdom and causing racial harmony and unity. And we need some people to stand up to challenge some of the laws. And number 13 <laughs> uh, is land relationships <laughs> with brothers like me who don't think the white man is the God or don't think the white man is the devil. And both of those are crucial because you've got black people on both sides. They've made white man the God. He's the answer to all of my problems. And then they got black man who says, that the white man is the reason that I have all of my problems. Build some authentic relationships with people who are confident in who they are, who are not angry, who are not bitter, who are not mad, who are not revengeful, but who at the same time <laughs> don't see you as their savior. And, 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 <laughs> Let me tell you how you can identify this with some of your black friends and some of your black congregations. My wife and I have experienced this for about 15, about 10 years because we go to a lot of multicultural churches. And it's amazing to me that when we walk into a multicultural church, how many black people will not look us in the eyes? How many black people at a multicultural church will avoid us. They won't welcome us. They won't embrace us. They won't encourage us. They won't shake our hands. They, they won't give us directions. They, they, they look at us, if they look at us, it's like we're invisible. And then as I observe them, they are having no interactions with other black people in the, in the church. I want you to be aware of that as your congregation. Your black members, do they have any other relationships with black people? Are they inviting any other black people? Are they encouraging the black people to come? Your friends, or do they, own, do they want to be your only black friendly? I'm Lee's black friend. Mm -hmm. And if that's happening, man, what they're going to do unconsciously, and you won't even realize it, they want exclusive rights because they put you in the God position. And they're not, they're not really good for your vision because if they were good for your vision, they would be drawing other people like them. I spent too much time there. And the 14th thing to do is leap into action. Do something. We can't be idle. We got to find something to do. Build relationships with someone. And uh, so, again, many of these things I can honestly say I've seen, witnessed, and benefited from New Heights doing this. Wow. Well, that's that's a great segue to my next question. <clears throat> that was, wow. All that you said was amazing. Um, thank you for spending so much time to walk us through that and to teach us and to encourage us. Uh, let me segue to this question. Towards the end of the last speech, ironically, that Dr. King ever gave, which was in Memphis, um, to the sanitation workers there who were striking. He said this quote, he said, be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together. Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. Ricky, in your opinion, what does a quote unquote dangerous kind of unselfishness look like in the American church today? You know, we can look at the life of Martin Luther King. You know, it's a big to do now that he came to be to uh, help the garbage man. You know, sanitation workers sound so much. It, does. it sounds nicer. <laughs> yeah. These were garbage men. And this was not on Dr. Martin Luther King's schedule. We've got a Nobel Prize prize winner, the, the most uh, visible speaker, man, probably in the world at that time. And he's going to alter his schedule 
and then stay in a crappy hotel to make sure that Santa taste garbage men get fair conditionings and fair. If he had not come, if he had not come, nobody would have really made a big stink about that. You know, this this is this question is really tough for me, Pastor Lee, because three years ago we had MLK 50 and Memphis was a buzz. You had denominations and pastors and celebrities and and presidential uh, all coming from around the world to Memphis, Tennessee. And man, I, I was I knew then that this was going to be a show. That, that what you're talking about right now, that, that everybody wanted some camera time, some space time, some, you know, I didn't get to, I didn't get to walk with Martin Luther King. You know, he, you hear everybody say, I walk with Martin Luther King. So, but that now the new thing is I was at the 50th MLK, but man, we saw no results. Look at America, three years after MLK, we're looking like the 60s. And I think that's because people are not willing to live selfless lives. And when you say the church, when you say what does a what does an unselfish church look like, like a pink pork pine in uh, Philadelphia, it's almost non-existent. Why? Because we, the church, which is a representation of the Christians. Man, we've become so selfish. It's about our race, our denomination, our city, our community. In order for us to be unselfish, and hear me now, I, I got to preface this before somebody gets, a, 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 well, let me say this. Well, let me just go and say it this way. In order for us to be unselfish, you've got to get rid of your superiority complex. And when I say, I know I said you, but I'm talking about people as a whole. Most of the time when we think superiority complex, we think mega church white pastor. No, I know black pastors with 10 members in a rented building that they're behind on that have a superiority complex. So it's not about race. It's about many times us trying to overcompensate for our low self-esteem so we feel like we got to suppress and oppress somebody else and depress somebody else so that we can feel better about who I am. Those people, them people, that man. And so we've got to get, in order for us to get become an unselfish church, we got to get rid of our, we got to become unself-righteous. We got to become unself serving. We got to become unself gratifying. And the church has to get back to its original intent. Number one, the church has to submit to the Savior, take on the nature of the Savior, display the Savior, attract other people to salvation. And that's what the church has to do. And so, you know, uh, a lot of times when we when we do things, <laughs> we're not really doing it for the glory of God. Sometimes we're doing it to make our church look superior or to make ourself feel superior. And that's why you have a lot of people that won't do stuff with the church. They want to go out and do their own ministry. Mm -hmm. New Heights, I have a feeding program, but I, no, I'm going to go out and feed the people by myself. Why wouldn't you go out with your congregation and let them see the church, the body of Christ as a whole? So partnerships are crucial. Uh, uh, letting go of your ego. Now let me deal with the word ego and then we can move to the, to the word, to the next, next topic. Ego means self. And what happens is we allow our ego comes in and the ego is designed to protect you from fears, wounds, and pains. The ego is designed to protect you from fears, 
wound and pain. And they don't necessarily have to be pain. They can be perceived pains. And so many times we allow our ego and what, what the enemy, the prince of the air has done, he has, he has divided us between race, denomination, gender, uh, education status, urban, suburban, rural. And what's happening is all of these division has weakened the strength of the body of Christ. Oh, when we all get together, what a day of rejoicing it will be. So we've got to submit to the Savior, serve the Savior, and realize that this man is going to cost something. You know, the, the rich young ruler, when he found out it was going to cost something, uh, he broke camp. And I think that's what happens to many Christians when we realize what it will cost to bring the glory and we miss the reward that's coming because we're so busy looking at the temporary loss. Well, that's good. You, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I could listen to you all day. God has um, uniquely given you an unbelievable amount of wisdom on so many topics, not just race, but just as a man of God, when you teach, when you preach, when you disciple, I'm, I'm grateful. Let me, let me ask you one last question that relates to this day that we are, we are celebrating. And it's not just Martin Luther King that we're mm -hmm. celebrating, but we're also celebrating the sanctity of human life. And so let, yeah. me, let me ask you this. How does Dr. Martin Luther King's day connect to the sanctity of Human Life Sunday? You know, Dr. Martin Luther King was about all life. And I want you to hear me from the womb to the tomb. It was about all life. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, I think that the enemy has really used this to be a, a, uh, a stronghold of division between uh, African-American churches and, and white churches or evangelical or charismatic churches, what, what, whatever way you want to go with that on it, is that there's not an either or. There's both. I went to the site. And uh, I went to the site about Right for Life, and they had this little pretty chocolate baby on it. She looked like a she looked like a sneakers bar. She, that's my favorite candy. She was so pretty. She looked like a sneakers bar on there, and uh, evoked smile, good emotions, convictions. But then I thought about what about that big black, dreaded brother with gold teeth and tattoos. Uh, that's facing the electric chair right now. Here's a question that came to my mind some months ago. You know, we do a lot of surveys. I would be interested for somebody to do a survey. Uh, and, and, and a lot of my, uh, my, my brothers, uh, and, and let me say this. I strategically and specifically go to some prayer meetings where I am the only black person there. So for some of you all, you may think I'm militant and at the same time, some of you all will think I'm an Uncle Tom. That's strategic. <laughs> I'm, I gotta be that bridge that becomes all things to all man. And I, this question came to my mind, Lee. I was, at, I was at one of these prayer meetings and a guy did a great sermon on how we have to preach the whole gospel from the pulpit. And he was very passionate and convicting. And it was challenging for me to receive because my assertion of his presentation of the gospel was preaching the whole gospel from the pulpit means we have to deal with homosexuality and abortion. And yes, those are major challenges, issues, sin, I call it sin. But in the midst of a riot, racism, uh, uh, folks doing all kind of 
uh, evil stuff with racism. I'm wondering why did the racism never make to preach from the gospel about abortion, about homosexuality? And this is a question. I'm going to get back to your question. Question is, I would love to see some research how many people are in a homosexual lifestyle and how many people are having abortions and how many people are murderers because their parents decided to have a life, but then what happens to the life after we decide to have life? So yes, I'm not gonna have an abortion is not enough. It's, that's the will of God, that's the ways of God. That's the ways that we should do. But what, what support groups do we have? And I wanna emphasize again, I am pro-life. I financially support pro-life. I preach pro-life. But I like to give people thoughts to think about. When you got a mother that has three children and is pregnant with a fourth child, that she doesn't have enough support, enough income, enough education, enough housing for these four, we've got to say, yes, have that fourth child, and we've got to have some systems, some structures, some support in place that, watch this, that she doesn't have that fourth child, go get a job, and we've seen this in Memphis, and gets June Bug, who just got out of jail, because she can't find anybody else to help keep her children and leave June Bug at the house with her children while she's out at work. And June Bug, who's been raped in prison and uh, who's grown up in a dysfunctional home and who is mad that he's got to stay and depend on a woman that he doesn't really like. And that kid begins to yell and that kid ends up, as he say, accidentally falling off the China cabinet. We have too many stories like that. That's life. The brother who's on death row, a third of black men who are on death row have been sodomized as children. That's life. So we've got to deal with from the womb to the tomb life. And, I'm, and, and hear me now, I'm not speaking from a, from a spirit of victimization, but I'm speaking from a victim that we need to broaden our revelation and put systems in place to support those who obey the will of God by not aborting a child. And listen, my mother contemplated abortion with me. My wife's mother uh, contemplated abortion with her. And so uh, I, I'm pro-life. <laughs> mm. Amen. So I'm open to any other questions or a dialogue on anything that I said. Man, that was fantastic. Um, I don't think I have anything else. Do you have any final thoughts or anything that you yeah. feel like God wants you to say? Yeah, I want to say uh, to New Heights, to your staff, your team, your members. And I, I really feel by the Holy Spirit, there are some people who are watching this who may not be a part of New Heights anymore because you didn't like the direction that New Heights was taking. I want you to consider the voice of God for your life. I understand what they were doing at that particular time was strange. It was out of the ordinary. Uh, it, it may look like it was not the will of God, but I want you to really examine the life of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Jesus challenged the status quo. Jesus challenged people to step outside of the boat. And what New Heights has done is they've stepped outside of the boat, the box, bigotry, and they've stepped into the brilliance and boldness of being in the will of God. I wanna challenge you that if you left New Heights because you're looking back now and you see how things have progressed in a, 
a way that you didn't even see coming. I want, I want to challenge you to repent. The word repent means turn. Listen, they need you. Listen, I'm not even in Fayetteville. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. I need you. There are people that don't even know the name, the nature, and the anointing of Jesus Christ. They need you. Don't forget about the amazing grace of God that was extended to you. Don't forget about that. Listen, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men's slackness, but is long suffering toward us and not willing that we should perish, but that we all should come to a place of repentance. Here's what repentance means, and then I'm going to be done. Repentance means rethink this thing. Think again. Repentance means retalk. Repentance means, let me say it this way, it means to change your thinking, change your talking, change your feelings, and change your actions. You are crucial to what God needs to be done in this season. You've been called for such a time as this. And my voice is convicting you only because Pastor Lee didn't put this together. I didn't put this together. This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in the sight. If you obey the Lord, if you obey and serve him, you should prosper your life. There's, there's somebody you've allowed the media to get so far in your mind that it has caused sickness to come upon your body. Your healing is in your repentance. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop. Your healing good word. is in your repentance. Good. And I'm going to stop there, Pastor Lee. Wow.